blank, right? So some people have that kind of stress response. So you want to give them a bit of places to practice so that they know, here's how you get the dashboards. Here's the channel to log into. Here's how the incident commander process works. They're very friendly. No one's going to bite you. It's going to be OK. But a lot of folks don't get into that in a natural way. So you want to get to a place where you're practicing that. And these kinds of chaos engineering practices are really good for that. You are simulating an outage. You want to simulate what happens downstream of that outage, what your organization expects you to do. They expect you to respond to the alerts, come to the channel, log on to the Zoom call, and participate, right? It helps you get organized. It helps you be explicit about all of those things so that folks aren't second guessing themselves, that they aren't in the moment when it's a real incident freaking out and not knowing where things are. So when we test IR during game days, there's a bunch of different things we can make sure are in place, because these are things that we don't want to have falling on the floor when there's a real incident, a real outage. The first is our alerts. Are we alerting on the right stuff? If I'm putting a slow query thing onto the database, and I'm not getting anyone telling me that, there's no alerts coming out of that system, I'm not going to know if it happens in real life. If I take that backend dependency offline, and none of the dependent systems tell me, how am I going to know, right? So making sure all of those alerts are configured, making sure all of that stuff is coming out of your systems and getting into a place where your humans know about it is super important. And if you're not thinking about it all the time, super easy to forget, or it's not part of your platform engineering or whatever you're doing yet, you want to drop that stuff on the floor. But you don't want that when there's a real incident. The next part's notifications. Love this one, because you get on a call and like everybody's phone is blowing up and it's amazing, right? But like people get new phones all the time, making sure they're, they've put their new system into whatever you're using and alerting, making sure that they've got it set so that it, if they don't respond to the first beep, it falls over, gets to the next one, whatever it is. Mine like push notifications and a text message and then it calls me on the phone and the robot tells me what's going on, all that great stuff. So you want all of that. And you want the coordination part. Where do you go? If it's a major incident, there's a specific permanent channel and a specific permanent Zoom call to use. Otherwise, go to the incident in your incident management platform and click on the URL for Zoom or Slack or Teams or whatever you're using so that folks know exactly how to get from responding to the alert to participating in the recovery. And then talk about troubleshooting and resolution. This is a really good one to do with all of your new engineers. Someone joins your team. And I have been on Sev1 calls where there's a new engineer on some team, and they're like, I've never done this before. And I'm like, shit. As the incident commander, I'm like, damn it, where's the other senior, right? So you don't want to have your new engineers get on the call and say, I've never restarted this service before. Give them an opportunity to practice restarting the services. Give them an opportunity to practice scaling up the services, turning them over, whatever kind of things you see most commonly in your systems. Do you get to the point where you need to deploy new pods or whatever you're doing, making sure everyone on your team has a safe place to practice that so that when the time comes and something has to happen for real, they're familiar with it, and they're comfortable with it, and they don't have any doubts, and they don't have any questions. And they're like, I got this. So we're going to set some goals. We're going to go into this very, like I mentioned, intentionally. Not just randomly picking things, but saying, you know, maybe we had a bug that came through, and it went out through that last sprint. It's been running in production for a little while. We've given it some time to bake in. But did we really fix it? Maybe we haven't had any customers calling about it, but we want to be sure. So we can go in there and we can flex it. This is really good if you deploy stuff under flags and it's not actually being surfaced to the customer yet, but you can flex it with your feature flags. Also good for stuff you can't replicate in your non-production environments. And I'll talk about production, non-production testing in a minute as well. But we, you get a lot of stuff that might be impacted by slight differences. And I say slight. I know what the differences are between most people's dev integration and production environments are not slight by any sense of the definition. But 
you might get to a point where you don't have a good place where you've replicated production. Maybe it's by the load or the traffic or whatever it is. And you want to do that in prod, right? So you can do that as well. That can be one of your questions, one of your goals. You can also do bigger stuff, DDoS or other attacks, right? Because the last thing you want to do if you're under attack is like nobody on the security team knows how to like call your CDN or the, the stuff that's in front of your systems to have your IP, those IPs blocked and that kind of stuff. Like all that stuff can be practiced as well so that folks know exactly where those things are, who to call, who's your contact at the service provider, all that stuff is super important. Because you know it's on a wiki page that hasn't been updated since 2021. Is it really the right data? Is it really the right information? If you're not flexing it, you don't know. So we're gonna hypothesize. We're gonna say, all right, well, we solved this thing. This behavior works this way. We think when we touch, turn this dial, it's gonna scale up automatically. Or maybe it's gonna fail over automatically. We're gonna fail over out of San Jose into Oregon or whatever. Maybe things are just gonna slow down a little bit and that's within our SLOs and people are gonna be okay with that and it's fine. Or maybe there'll be some kind of grace for replacement where we have to like completely pull things over. So depending on how much automation you have in place, there might be a bunch of things that could happen sort of automatically as you're testing these and you can test all of that automation as well. So for very sophisticated environments, it's still super helpful to be doing these kinds of tests. And I will say that some of our environments are a little bit more sophisticated than others as things get migrated. So we have all kinds of things that people play with. Then we want to talk about, you know, what, what, actually, what actually did happen? Like we know what we think was going to happen, what we hoped in our heart of hearts was going to happen. pin out of something. So knowing exactly then what happened, super important, because then you know what to look for if it happens for real. And hopefully you can shore it up and fix it in the meantime. And then you really want to talk about what you learned. Who does postmortems? Nice, excellent. And do you post them somewhere and nobody ever reads them? Yes. That's exactly how these work, right? They are beautiful <laughs> and then no one talks about them. When you're working with these kinds of things, especially if you have a large team that shares a lot of shared platform stuff, like when you're learning something, especially about defensive coding or graceful degradation or something in your corner of the environment, sharing that stuff out, especially if it's like a brown bag or a lunch and learn or having like a, a community of practice or a center of excellence or whatever you want to call it, um, is super helpful with these, right? If you run the test and I have the same stack, I should learn from your test. Maybe I don't have to run it then, right? Like I can just borrow what you guys did and then I can move on to the next question and we don't have to repeat ourselves with all that stuff. So we get really good at talking about what you did, what you found, what the impacts are, what you're gonna do about it, all that great stuff. Some folks for larger coordinated exercises will do an entire post-mortem or retrospective or whatever you want to call it with the full documentation and the timeline and all the things that we tried so that we know what happened. And we know if we see that again in real time, what we should be looking for. Because maybe we pulled up the wrong dashboard. Maybe we were looking at the wrong data to begin with. And it turns out all oh, was over on this dashboard. I've not that I've ever seen that, right? So things happen. We want to learn from it. I'm going to tell as many people as possible so that everybody can learn from it. And then we want to get all that stuff back into the product cycle. Who has a really good relationship with their product manager? Like your buds and you talk all the time. Yeah, a handful of people and everybody else is like, I'm not sure who my product manager is. Sometimes we talk to these people, they come into our meetings, they've got slide decks and like wireframes, but like we don't really listen to them. Um, Getting the stuff that you learn back into your product cycle is probably the most challenging part of this because it's not technical, right? This is an organizational, cultural thing. Because what you're, most of what you're gonna learn in these kinds of tests are sort of non-feature operational requirements kinds of stuff, right? 
the system must keep running in order for customers to pay us for it versus it must have all these amazing features. And getting that stuff back into the product, when the product manager is like, oh, I got features all the time. Feature, 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 feature. And that can get in the way, right? So having a good conversation with your product manager about what you're hoping to learn and what the potential is to then do about it after you've gone to all this work, because you've got the plan, you've got your hypothesis, and you've made all this scheduling, and yada, yada, all this stuff. You want to be able to use that. You can also use these tests to help with your SLOs. So who's using SLOs? Man, like, come on. What, what the hell, right? So like, OK. Um, SLOs are super interesting, right? So if you're not super familiar with them, the, the idea is that a lot, of, especially in a microservices environment, we have a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things can go sort of a little bit wobbly, a little bit. I'll tell you a story about, okay, back when I was at AOL, right? So I got a call one like Thursday night, right? And Jeff, the, Steve Case was in Hawaii on his like pineapple farm or whatever he's doing over there. And he's like, the CEO can't get to the main page. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. He's like halfway across the world. Everything's fine from here, right? But that's not the call you want, right? We don't want to wake somebody up in the, in the middle of the night for something that's weird or transient or it's like something your packet got lost in Topeka, right? We want to get to a place where the things that we're alerting actual human beings about are actual real problems. And one of the approaches to that that's sort of emerged in the past few years is making use of uh, service level indicators and then service level objectives for those indicators. So your indicator doesn't necessarily need to be, we need 99.99% .99 uptime. You're not dial tone, so you're probably not getting there anyhow. But like picking the things that are super important to you, whether it's the um, time to respond or our time to serve the whole page or whatever it is, setting a good threshold for those. And then if you don't get too close to the threshold and some transient things come in, you just ignore them for a while, right? So you're only waking people up if you have a big problem. So you can set those kinds of goals. And they're a little bit more granular than just saying, we need you to be up all the time. So the thing about those is they are internal tools for your team and to talk about how your service performs, how you are focused on giving the best experience to your users. And certain things can sort of fall apart and users may not care, right? If there's one little widget in the corner isn't available that nobody clicks on anyway, it's just kind of there, who cares, right? So you can use these um, as an internal tool to sort of modify your own expectations of your reliability and you can flex them then during your chaos tests to be able to say, oh, you know what, we added this new feature and this new defensive coding practice that we've adopted, whether it's red button or feature flag or whatever it is, allows us to get a little bit more room out of our SLO, that sounds great. That means the next time something happens for real, an incident happens, we can delay that. It's not as bad as we thought it was going to be and the customers are still gonna be okay. So you can use that then to adjust how you manage the environment when it gets into production. Super helpful. Because the last thing, like, when PagerDuty, man, we love paging you, but not really. Like, we want to be your friend. We don't want you to wake up in the middle of the night. So we want you to sleep, because we want to sleep as well. So we, when I give this talk to some of our customers, the, the first question that we usually get is, should we do this as a surprise? Be like, yeah, we got one right answer over here. It'd be no, absolutely flipping not. And that was part of the, sort of the original lore, right, of chaos engineering, is that you didn't know what was gonna happen, you're just gonna randomly pull a cable or whatever. M most of the time, <laughs> your engineering organization's not really gonna be ready for that. Like, this is a, a practice that takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of organizational support, right, to dedicate these resources into this kind of testing. And it's gonna take you a long time to get to the point where like, you could pull anything out of your cloud account 
across anything in your environment, and every possible team that's in your organization would be able to respond to it. So don't do this to people, right? Be very intentional and be very specific about what you're expecting from them. The other question is, when do you run one of these? And again, we're not surprising people, right? The other thing is, because we do a lot of ours very small, and each individual team in the, in the organization, and there's, I forget how many 20 some odd teams there are, they can do any of their tests any time on their sort of corner of the system, any day, right? They can get on the schedule, it's in a wiki page, and just put in what day they're gonna do what. And then it, it pop into the channel, and everybody can follow along. Now, if you want to coordinate across lots of teams, right, that was sort of the original plan when everybody was in the monolith, everybody coordinated together and everybody was in the war room and had pizza, then that takes a little bit of extra coordination, right, and talking to other teams and figuring out, oh, hey, we're gonna do this thing on Friday, it might touch some of your stuff, do you wanna be part of it, do you wanna be part of the exercise, do you have other things you wanna test, and all that kind of stuff can be there too. But if you're gonna do it in production, you wanna be very conscious of how it's gonna impact your users, right? And you don't have to do these in production. You can actually run game days in your other environments to get some practice, to make sure you're flexing all the things that you need to flex, to make sure you've defined your alerts correctly and all that kind of basic stuff, and that's fine. Originally, when folks were pitching game days and chaos engineering as a, as a real practice, they're like, you have to do it in production. I'm like, no, no, you absolutely do not. But if you're going to do it in production, you do it at a time when the system is kind of stable, things are kind of safe. If you're working with SLOs and error budgets, you have some space there to be able to say, oh, we're only at 80% of our error budget for this month. We can go ahead and run this for a while. Don't blow out all of your error budgets on testing. That's never a good idea, because then you don't have any left if there's a real incident that happens. And then they ask, when do you not game day? Now obviously, if your platform isn't stable, you don't want to run a game day, right? If you're having some errors and you're trying to fix them, that's great, you should be trying to fix them, right? But at the same time, your customers don't know what you're doing. They don't know that today's instability is a test versus yesterday's instability, which was actually a bug, right? So make sure that you're preserving the customer experience, your user experience, when you're doing these kinds of tests. The other thing that comes up is another non-technical question, because everybody loves a reorg, right? But you don't game day, <laughs> you're nuts, but you don't game day after a reorg, right? Someone's just inherited a new service, and you're like, we're going to game day on this tomorrow. And they're like, I don't even know. I don't have permissions to this stuff yet. Like, they're not going to be able to help you, and it's not going to help them, right? So make sure that the platform's been stable for a while. Make sure your org has been stable for a while. Make sure your other tooling has been in place for a while so that people have a, have a good experience of learning from this entire process. Because you need to get things out of it. It is a so you're putting time and resources into it. You want to get stuff out of it, right? It's not just, it's not just fun, even though it kind of is. So that's the summary there. So we have a bunch of resources about this. We have, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, PagerDuty has been doing these for a long time. So we've got a couple of blog posts about the things that we've been doing, how we approach it, and it's, there's an earlier post and then one from last year that sort of updates on how things change as the org grows, right? Because we have a lot more engineers now than we did when we first started. Um, the tooling has changed because this part of the, the industry is maturing and it's now been commercialized. So early on it was a lot of open source projects, a lot of like ad hoc kind of things, a lot of homegrown stuff. Um, so a lot of those things have been improved. I also have on, on the link there, um, I had two of our senior engineers on our 
um, live stream on Twitch last year to talk through some of that history and share some of their experiences with this as they've kind of you know, matured the practice. One's our staff SRE, one runs our DBRE team. And so we went through some of the practice there. So if you're into like taking a look at some of this stuff, that one in particular is super interesting because they, they did kind of get into um, some of the things they learned, some things have been changed. We learned about the demise of Chaos Cat, unfortunately, and, and all that great stuff. But if you're looking for you know, ways to get started, things to think about, things to talk about with your boss, right? If you're just like, we don't do any of this, and we're like blindsided when something happens in production, right? You break it down into the components that you want to try and improve, right? We want to have a plan, but you can have a plan for your alerting and how you want to make sure that it's okay. You can have a plan for notifications and making sure that everybody has got the stuff that they need and knows where to go and the coordination and all that kind of stuff. And then you can have a plan for what do we actually do when we have an incident in production? Hopefully, your team has decided or has sort of illuminated for everybody what you do when something goes wrong. Are you a fix-forward shot shop? No. <laughs> are, you a, are you a rollback shop? Are you a pull it and pray and hope that you know, somebody's going to fix it offline and then you're going to try and backport it into the configuration management or like somebody's going to fix it live and then it goes back into GitHub, hopefully someday, right? So have a plan about all that stuff. And make sure you're sharing it with the other teams in your organization, right? It's part of like making sure that if you have to change teams, you want things to be good over there too, right? Like you don't want to have like some dark team in the corner like they don't know anything right. Be intentional about what you're hoping to learn and what you're actually going to do. You get on the, the failure any day call and they're just like, I don't know, should we like try and like bury the dependency or should we slow things down? Or should we try some IO test or whatever your, your uh, solution provides? Be intentional of that beforehand, especially because a lot of what you want to do here is practicing around recent features, recent fixes, things that you are working on in service of the customer experience, obviously, but things that you've been working on most recently are really good places to pick up and say, hey, we added an index to the database. Let's make sure that this is going to help us. And then make sure you can use what you learn. If you don't have a really good relationship with your product manager or your engineering manager doesn't have a, a good relationship with your product manager, help that, right? Have a chat, have some conversations. Make sure you are catching what you're learning in the kind of language that the product folks kind of understand. You know, here's what we learned when we tried this test and we buried this dependency, like here's where the traffic dropped off. Here's where people abandoned things, right? They, they just left. Where'd they go? Are they going to come back? Who knows? But then you can show that to your product manager to be able to say, hey, we need to shore this up. We need to make sure that this component that's very, very key to our user experience is behaving well, is performing where we need it to be performing, so that you can prioritize the things that you learn off these tests. And that is sometimes a hard discussion to have. If your product manager is very feature focused, you can get in there. So thank you for coming to my talk. Um, as I said, the resources are there. Um, thank you. If you are totally new to incident response, we have an amazing incident response guide. It's open source. It's hosted there, but if you're into running MK docs for yourself, you can totally fork it and do that at responsapedia.com. And we also have a podcast my team runs. We're always looking for interesting stories um, from around the industry. We cover like all kinds of stuff. Um, it's not just you know outage of the week kind of thing, um, but we'd love to have folks on there. So you can always get in touch with me if you'd like to share your story there. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mandy.